So Ruth, you're going to talk to us about pensions law for employment lawyers and HR people who are not pension managers. What are the top three things that you want to tell us about? Okay, Jane. Well, I thought I'd tell you about pensions clauses in employment contracts, because that's a thing that employment lawyers and HR lawyers need to think about. Also, looking at the other end of the spectrum at pensions when you're dealing with termination and how to deal with that in your settlement agreement. And thirdly, we have automatic enrolment, part of workplace pension reform, which is something that applies to all UK employers. So employment contracts, that's being clear at the start about what the pension entitlement is, is drafting carefully for that? Yeah, exactly. So making sure that your provisions on pensions are really clear, but also that they don't go further than they need to in terms of saying what the pension provision is for an employee. So less is more can be the case sometimes, Often, can it? yeah. I think sometimes with pensions, the temptation is to put a lot into the contractual clause. And if you're putting in things like fixed contribution rates for the employer or the employee, or you're writing in automatic enrolment into your contractual provision, it may then be quite tricky to tra- change that going forwards, which can sometimes be an issue for employers. And there's always that bit in precedence that talks about contracting out, um, which I think most people don't really understand and leave it in. Is that is that relevant? Yeah, that's no longer relevant because contracting out has actually been abolished in UK pension schemes. But the good news is that if you still have those provisions in there because of legacy clauses, they just won't apply anymore because the statutory re- repeal of contracting out um, is overriding. So essentially now you don't need to include anything on contracting out if you're drafting from scratch. But if you've got something in there already, don't worry about it. It just won't apply. So looking at the other end of the employment cycle, if you're moving somebody on or or they've resigned or you're you're exiting somebody, what are the kind of key things to, key flags, if you like to have in your mind uh, as an HR person or an employment lawyer dealing with that? I guess it would be think about pensions early on because I think sometimes that can get left until the final draft of the settlement agreement and it actually can be quite complex. Defined benefit pensions, which is where the employee has a guaranteed amount of pension when they come to draw their benefits, are fairly complicated. So I'd suggest taking advice if you're thinking of drafting anything in the settlement agreement that's dealing with defined benefit pensions. Defined contribution, which is where both the employee and the employer usually have put in a certain amount of money into a pot that will then be used to buy a pension or benefits at the end, um, is dealt with more commonly in settlement agreements because particularly with workplace pension reform, that tends to be the more common pension that employees have. There are a number of things to think about when you're looking at dealing with settling defined contribution pensions in a settlement agreement. A few things would be tax, so make sure the tax treatment of any pension sums that you're paying are dealt with correctly. Also make sure that you're setting out clearly in the agreement what pension contributions you are making and how they're being dealt with. And check that the scheme that you're paying across to will actually accept the contributions because the trustees, or in the case of a personal pension plan, the provider, need to be able to accept those contributions if that's something you're promising the employee you will do under a settlement agreement. So we often have the bit in the claims clause in a settlement agreement that talks about um, excluding from the waiver of claims accrued pension rights. Does that that mean you can never settle a pensions accrued right or how how does that work? So again settling pensions disputes in particular can be complicated and generally the principle is that the pension benefits that an employee has already built up so they're already kind of banked can't be waived so you can't just expect an employee to give up those rights but when it comes to settling pension rights more broadly I think there is a bit of a misperception that you can't settle those at all you can but you need to be very careful with your wording and take advice on it because there have been cases that have shown that even where the wording looks quite robust it doesn't necessarily settle all the claims that might be envisaged. And auto-enrolment, so that's been with us for a while now. Uh, what's, what's changed? What do we need to know about at the moment? So it has been around for a while, but employers are still finding their feet with it, I think. And a lot of smaller UK employers are now obviously uh, coming on board with auto-enrolment and the employer duties under the Pensions Act are applying to them. Just as a refresher, this is the uh, duty on all UK employers to enrol eligible job holders into a workplace pension scheme and start paying contributions towards that scheme for them. Uh, A few updates on this really. Um, One is that the staging dates for 
increases in contributions have been put back slightly by the government. I think uh, partly in recognition to how complicated this is and also economic concerns. So the dates for the contribution levels going up have been put back, so worth checking if you're a UK employer. Um, there have been a few changes to NEST, which is the National Employment Savings Trust. A few relaxations, really, around some restrictions that NEST had on transfers in and out mm -hmm. and on the maximum amount that could be saved into NEST if you were using that to satisfy your employer duties. And if, you, if you've been auto-enrolled for a while or if you've been caught um, by your staging date for a while, is there a point at which you kind of review your arrangements? Is there a, a sort of a refresher period, if you like? You need to be re-enrolling eligible job holders every three years. So this is something that employers will still need to keep under review. They might also want to keep their providers under review, particularly because there's going to be increased regulation on master trusts. Um, and so if you are using a provider, maybe reviewing that provider early on before you get to re-enrolment so that you can keep your options open.